Hello everyone and welcome back to A-Level Psychology. Today we're going to be looking at Social Influence Lesson 9, which is all about minority influence. We'll start by looking at the theory element of the topic and an example six mark outline so that you can see how it all comes together in an exam. And then we'll follow that up with some evaluation points and some exam questions. So let's get right into it. Minority influence refers to situations in which one person or a small group of people influences the beliefs and the behavior of other people. It's different to conformity because in conformity, the majority is doing the influencing, whereas obviously in minority influence, it's the minority that's doing the influencing. It's most likely to lead to internalization, which if you remember means that people change their public behavior and their private beliefs. And research has generally pointed to three main processes used by successful minorities. Those processes are consistency, commitment, and flexibility. And that is what the first part of this video is going to look at. So consistency means that minorities have to stick to their beliefs because nobody's going to take them seriously if they're constantly changing their minds. They have to be consistent over time, which is known as diachronic consistency and they have to maintain consistency within the group, which is known as synchronic consistency. You can't have one member of the group saying something different to the others because it'll give the impression that you don't know what you want and so people won't take you very seriously. Moving on, commitment means that minorities have to show dedication to their cause. Some minorities do this by engaging in extreme activities to draw attention to their views, and if these activities come at some level of personal risk or sacrifice, then they'll generally have more of an impact because they're demonstrating a greater commitment. And that is known as the augmentation principle. Okay, so augmentation means to enhance or to increase. So taking some personal risk or demonstrating some kind of personal sacrifice increases or enhances the attention that's drawn to your view or to your cause. And then finally, the minority has to be flexible. Now, it's important that they are flexible so that they're not seen as rigid and uncompromising. The minority needs to be adaptable and needs to be able to listen to the viewpoints of others because not doing so would shed them in a negative light and would ultimately harm their cause. I'm sure everybody has been in a conversation, argument, or discussion with somebody at some point and has found that that person will not back down and won't change their mind no matter what. Even if you are providing some really, really good counter arguments, they just don't listen and just stick to their guns. Obviously, when that happens, it makes people just not want to engage with the conversation. So the key is always to strike a nice balance between consistency, commitment, and flexibility in order to make a big impact. Now used correctly, commitment, consistency, and flexibility can bring about what's known as the process of change. And that's when the majority starts to process the new ideas more deeply. And that could involve simply thinking about the ideas a little bit more, but it could also mean that they go off and do some research of their own and read up on the topic. It could also mean that they start talking about it to their friends and family. Either way, they're processing the information. And over time, that processing results in what's known as conversion. And that's where people's views change to the minority view. And the more that happens, the quicker the rate of conversion becomes. And that's known as the snowball effect. Gradually, the minority view will end up becoming the majority view, and that is when change has occurred. Okay? So, there's been a fair amount of information there, so in a nutshell, here it is again. You've got your three processes that make for effective minorities. You've got consistency, commitment, and flexibility. And if used correctly, they can lead to the process of change, which involves deeper processing of the information, the process of conversion, and then the snowball effect, which ultimately leads to change on a wider scale. Okay, so I hope all of that has made sense. Before we finish off the outline bits, there's an important piece of research that was done by Moscovici into the importance of a consistent minority. 
and it's a piece of research that you really should know for this topic. Now, the study was called the Blue-Green Slide Study, and it was done in 1969. And basically what happened was that he had 172 women put into groups of six and shown 36 blue slides. But the blue always varied in intensity. And the women were asked if the slides were blue or green. Now within each group of six, there were two confederates. And those confederates consistently said that the slides were green. And Moscovici found that the participants agreed to the wrong answer on almost 8.5% of the trials. Now, I realise 8.5% isn't exactly groundbreaking, but by comparison, in a control group where the Confederates were inconsistent, in that sometimes they said the slides were green and sometimes they said they were blue, the participants only agreed to an incorrect answer on 1.25% of the trials which does show the importance of a consistent minority. Okay, so you've got a nice little bit of research there. The beauty of this piece of research is that you can use it in an outline as a piece of research, or you could use it in an evaluation point as research support. So before we move on to the evaluation points, I just want to show you how all this would come together in a six mark outline. And actually, I've got two different versions of an outline in this video so that you can see that there are different ways that you could do this. So the question is a straightforward six marker, outline research into minority influence. And this is option one. So as you can see, I've got a little bit of an introduction, but then my outline is all theory. Because remember, when you're being asked to outline research, you don't have to have a study in there. Okay, research just means theory or study. It doesn't have to be both. Okay, so that's option one. And then you've got option two, which is like this. As you can see, far less about the actual theory. There is a little bit in the first two little paragraphs, but it does include the blue-green slide study. Okay, and then you've got a little bit of theory down at the bottom there as well, which talks about the process of change, but it's only about one and a half sentences. Both of those outlines are around 200 words long, and both are good answers to the question. So just keep in mind, both of them are fine, but you will need to fit your evaluation points to your outline. So if you're using option two, where you're talking about Moscovici, you're going to need at least one evaluation point for the study, so that you're actually evaluating the thing that you've outlined. Okay, so just, just keep that in mind. And obviously, if you're using Moscovici in your outline section, then you can't use Moscovici as research support, okay? Because you don't want to be repeating yourself. Okay, so let's move on to part two of the video, which is all about the evaluation points. I've got quite a few evaluation points for you in this one because there's a lot of different ways in which you can use them. So I'll go through all of them briefly. None of them are massively complicated. It always just depends on how you want to use them. So first and foremost, you have some problems with Moscovici's research. Those problems are very straightforward. He used a biased sample of 172 female participants from America, which means that not only is it culture biased, but it is also gender biased as well. In this evaluation point, I have focused mainly on the gender bias thing. We can't generalize the results to other populations, for example, male participants. So we can't conclude that male participants would respond to minority influence in the same way. Also, I've reached back to my conformity knowledge because we actually know from other research that females are more likely to conform to a group and go along with others because they have a greater need for social belonging and approval. That was researched by Nito et al. and you may have come across that when you did ASH. You can, of course, bring a little bit of culture bias in here as well if you want and do an individualist versus collectivist culture comparison. That would also be fine. That's just another way of doing it. Moving on, you have some research support for consistency. Now, this brings me to what I was saying earlier. You cannot use this point or you shouldn't use this point if you've already used Moscovici somewhere else. The simple reason being is that your second paragraph in here refers to Moscovici as research support. So, if you've used Moscovici in your outline, or if you've used Moscovici as an evaluation point, then 
you need to make sure you get rid of that second paragraph in this evaluation point because otherwise you just end up repeating yourself okay so that would make it a little bit of a shorter point but at least you're not repeating yourself and telling me information that you've already said somewhere else now moving on to some research support for deeper processing so you have some research by martin et al in the study, participants were presented with a message that supported a particular viewpoint, and their agreement to that viewpoint was then measured. The group was then split into two. One of the groups heard a minority group agree with the viewpoint, and then another group heard a majority group agree with it. And then, finally, they were all exposed to a conflicting viewpoint and their attitudes were measured again. Okay, so their attitudes to the initial viewpoint were measured again. And what they found was that people were less willing to change their opinions if they had listened to a minority group agree with it than if they'd listened to a majority group agree with it. Okay, so the thinking here is that the people who heard a minority group agree with the message had actually processed the information more deeply because it had come from a minority as opposed to a majority. Okay, so research like that then supports the central argument about how minority influence actually works, in that they encourage deeper processing, which then ultimately leads to a change of belief. Okay, but you also do have a counterpoint to that, which is that research that's done into minority influence very often can't reflect the real world situation that is often much more complicated than a piece of research can ever really reproduce. So for example, in the real world, majorities usually have a lot more power, they have a lot more status, and minorities have to be very committed to their cause because very often they face very hostile opposition. So the social dynamics of being a minority are usually absent from minority influence research. The minority in a piece of research is simply the smallest group, but that isn't how it works in the real world. So that means that Martin et al's findings are very limited in what they can actually tell us about minority influence in the real world because the study can't replicate the dynamics of being a minority in the real world. Okay? And then a final point is just one to think about, and that is the real world implications, or more importantly, the ability of such research to be able to explain real world events. So examiners will love it if you can draw on real world events to actually support the research that's gone into minority influence. So the research can actually explain how a lot of real world minorities have brought about change. For example, the suffragettes, the civil rights movement, and also more recently, climate change as well. People draw attention by being consistent, by being committed, by potentially putting themselves in vulnerable or dangerous situations, but also by being flexible and also by listening to the people that are around them. Okay, so if you can bring all of that research and use a real world example to show how it can actually be explained using minority influence, you'll pick up a lot of marks for that because, like I said, an examiner will love it. And that is where we are going to finish off our evaluation section. So just before we get to the end of the video, I've got a couple of exam questions for you. We have a three marker, a six marker, and an eight marker. Now the three marker is very straightforward. It is a really easy, nice three marks to get in an exam. You just simply have to name three behaviors that enable a minority to influence a majority. And obviously those would be your consistency, commitment, and flexibility. You don't need to explain what they are because the question is simply name. The second question, the six marker, is an application question. Now, you have to refer to the scenario and you have to give examples. It will be very tempting to just say, Jenny needs to make sure that she is consistent in her beliefs, which means that she is not allowed to change her mind. That's not enough. Okay, you have to give examples of what Jenny's consistency might look like. Equally, if you're going to talk about the fact that it's important for Jenny to accept counter arguments, you have to give an example of what flexibility for Jenny might look like. 
So, for example, you might make a suggestion that people only grade work once a term rather than stopping completely. Okay, if you don't refer to the scenario and if you don't give examples, then you will drop a lot of marks. And then finally, we have an eight mark essay. Don't trip up over this, please. It only asks you about two elements. Okay, so you need to outline consistency and commitment, and then you need to discuss how they contribute to minority influence. Don't be confused or don't worry about the word discuss. It is effectively an outline and evaluate. You just have to make it a little bit more of a discussion. So you have to have strengths and limitations. You have to show why the research is good, why the research is bad. But it is only worth five marks, that discussion bit. So two evaluation points should be plenty. You could use Moscovici for consistency and then challenge Moscovici. Then you've got a nice little chunky evaluation point there for consistency and then any of the other evaluation points for commitment would also be good. Okay, you could even use the real world events and you could use the augmentation principle from the civil rights, let's say, refer to things like freedom riders and the danger that people might have been putting themselves in, danger of arrest, danger of being attacked. And you can use that then to kind of show that it worked because obviously large scale change came about due to that movement. OK, so there's a lot of things that you can talk about there. It's a nice little essay, but please just take the time to plan it before you start writing it. Otherwise, you won't get the right structure and you'll drop marks. OK, so that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's all been useful and I hope it's made sense. If there's any confusion or if you have any questions, please drop me a comment down below and I will get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll see you in the next one.